the book of Joshua, the topic was the victorious Christian life. And uh, I was wrestling with whether to go back into the New Testament, but the uh, Lord laid on my heart that uh, these two really go together. They're like bookends. The book of Joshua talks about the victories, and the book of Judges talks about the defeats. And there's lots of lessons to be drawn from each uh, as we look at uh, uh, this passage. And I hope uh, that likewise it will uh, give you uh, some good uh, lessons as we begin to study this passage. Uh, I'll give you just a, a brief re renewal, especially for our visitors who are here this morning. Uh, in this victorious Christian life that we looked at in the book of Joshua, uh, we saw at the beginning of Joshua the conquest of the land as they came in uh, through the Jordan River on dry ground. As the Lord rolled back the, the Jordan River, they came in, they faced Jericho and then the kings of the land. And, God gave them victory after victory after victory after victory. Thirty-one kings in all uh, did they defeat between Moses and Joshua. Moses two and Joshua, uh, well, thirty-three in total. Thirty-one for Joshua, th uh, two for Moses. Thirty-three kings in all as they went into the land. That was the conquest of the land. And then we saw the division of the land as he divided the land among the tribes of Israel and they got their inheritance. And then, uh, and then he tasked them, uh, once the, uh, the armies and the, the kings were defeated, to go in and take possession of the land. It's one thing to have a land grant given to you, but it's another thing to occupy it or possess it. And so they were instructed on multiple occasions, as we saw in the book of Joshua, to go in and possess their inheritance. And that's where a lot of Christians uh, come up short. Uh, we have an inheritance. We, God has given us an inheritance, but we often fail to possess or occupy all that God has given us. Uh, and uh, we looked at that. And we saw the perils uh, that comes from that when we fail to do that. And uh, when we don't do what God has called us to do, you, we see the, the perils of falling away and the things that accompany it, complacency. We get comfortable. Uh, we start to compromise. Uh, our commitment uh, to the Lord begins to waver. And uh, pretty soon we end up breaking the covenant that God has made with us. You know, the famous passage in Joshua 24, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. We need men today, okay? We need men that lead their families. Men that had, uh, keep that commitment, uh, that set the pace, that are, do not uh, grow complacent and compromise. Uh, we live in a day and age where that's not happening. And uh, uh, so we, we saw that in the book of uh, Joshua. Now when we get to the book of Judges, which we're going to launch into this first chapter, but I, I wanted to, to frame it up a little bit for you. It is a picture of the defeated Christian life. Now, after Moses died and then Joshua died, we don't see any record in the Scripture that God anointed one man to lead Israel. Okay? He had sent them back, Joshua sent them back into their possessions to possess the land and to drive out the Canaanites. Israel, under God's design, is a theocracy. Okay, in other words, the Lord is king. Now what you've got here in the book of Judges, you have a, a period of time between Moses and Joshua and the books of Kings that, that follow this. And this interlude in between is referred to as the book of Judges. It covers 300 plus years of the history of the nation of Israel. And, uh, and a very, it, it's the worst period of time in the history of the nation. Uh, but God did not appoint a successor to Joshua for the whole nation. The Lord was to be their leader, okay? As one day when He comes back and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God, it will be King Jesus calling the shots, okay? 
It won't be uh, Vladimir Putin or, or Barack Obama or any other little K kings. It will be the Lord from heaven, the King of kings and Lord of lords who will be calling the shots uh, when he returns. And that's what he uh, uh, intended. Now he does use men and he does call men as we saw uh, back in the book of Joshua. He used Moses and Joshua. He called them. He called Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And he called Joshua to lead them into the promised land. And if you remember the, the passage out of Deuteronomy 4, it says, And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with mighty power out of Egypt, to drive out nations before thee greater than mightier than thou, to bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is to stay. So God does call men, okay? He called Moses to lead him out of Egypt, which is a picture of salvation. And he called Joshua to lead them into the land that they might receive their inheritance and possess the land. That was their purpose. And after Joshua died, as recorded in the last chapter of Joshua, you don't see a successor named. Because now the tribes are back into the land. The tribes have been tasked to go and drive the Canaanites the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites out of the land and take their possession. They don't, as this passage, and Chris read the entire thing, you can't help but miss, Judah didn't drive them out because they had chariots of iron in the valley. And this one, and Asher, and Manasseh, and Naphtali, and all, each one, they did not drive them out. And as a result, the judgment of God fell upon them. Just as the book of Joshua foretold. He told them that if they don't, in Joshua 24, verse um, Eighteen through twenty. It says, The Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwell in the land. Therefore we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord. For he is a holy God and is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression nor your sin. You see, God is a holy God. We can't serve him in our own power. It's not possible. Now, the whole issue is that if you're, you need to be born again, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's the beginning point. You get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. You have the Spirit indwelling you. But if you don't walk in the Spirit, if you don't walk after the Spirit, uh, you're, and you think you're going to take on the devil, he's going to pistol whip you with your water pistol. Okay? Uh, you can't serve the Lord until you realize He's a holy God. This whole idea of playing Christianity, playing at it, and, and thinking somehow we're going to get the blessings of God, we're smoking dope. It ain't going to happen. He says, verse 20 of Joshua 24, he says, If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you, after the, he hath done you good. So, in the book of Joshua, he lays out the key to victory. The key to victory is serving the Lord. The key to victory is following the Lord. The key to victory is obedience to the Lord. The key to victory is faith. But when you get to the book of Judges, as this chapter and the ones that will follow you'll see that they did not do what they were tasked to do. And so he begins this. There is, like I said, there is no successor name because God is supposed to be the one that they're following. And they were to go in and possess the land, which meant driving out the ites of the land, the Canaanites. Not getting comfortable with the Canaanites like we're doing today. The church today 
is just like this period of time. Okay? Playing games, playing Christianity, okay? Put on this uh, false face on Sunday morning, live like the devil and like the world for the rest of the week. And he says, you do that. He says, I will bring upon you the things that I told you I would bring upon them. I will do you hurt after that I told you I'd do you good. And God's people need to learn that. And some of them are the hard way. Their lives, their families, they are a walking disaster area. They're like a motorboat going through a lake with three inches of water and three feet of mud. It's just throwing a rooster tail out the back of the boat of mud and dirt, okay? That's what you got going on today. God is a holy God. God is a jealous God. He's not in it to play, okay? And that's the problem. Now, we'll take a look here. Number one, just again, just, this is the introduction. We'll get into chapter one in just a second. Number one, what is the role of a judge? What is the role of a judge? The Hebrew word is shephat, okay? And I, I don't think anybody's here is a Hebrew scholar. But if you just look up in your Bible, each time this word appears and what the scripture, it will define itself. And it's defined in Judges 2.16. You got your Bible open, just flipped to 16th verse, the second chapter. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, Shaphat, <clears throat> which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Okay? So a judge today, we think of the guy with the long black robe that sits behind the desk, you know, when the attorneys come up. But that is not the judge of the Old Testament. Now, they did judge, so they, that is a part of their role, but they were deliverers. It's also translated in that old King James Bible, defenders, avengers. In other words, what happens is you're going to see in the book of Judges seven cycles of defeat. They're, they're starting off at the high point here in chapter 1. It's all downhill from here, okay? It is a downhill run. Martha's up teaching the kids, but one of her famous sayings is they're circling the drain, okay? Well, let me tell you, the children of Israel here in the book of Judges are circling the drain. That's what this book is about. And, but God periodically, and in seven times through this, as they turn away from him, he will bring defeat into their lives and in these, these nations that they're cohabiting with. They will begin to feel the effect of their sin. And then in their low point, they will call upon the Lord to deliver them. And he raises up a judge like Gideon and others that we're going to see in here, Deborah. He raises up a judge and he restores them back into basically a picture of salvation. He saves their bacon, so to speak. He brings them back up to the top. They serve him for a while. They fall back into sin. Back judgment comes again. At the bottom, they cry unto the Lord, and he delivers them back with another judge and puts them back on top again. And so, and so, and so goes the cycle. He raised up judges. So that's what a judge is as we start going through here. Now, what's the outline of the book of Judges? Like I say, around here, normally on Sunday morning, we're doing expositional preaching and teaching. There's a time for topical stuff too. We do that on Bible Institute that will resume back in October after the farmer's market on uh, Wednesday nights and things. But what's the outline? And it's pretty simple. In chapters 1 and 2, you have the apathy, the apathy of God's people. They have gotten complacent. They've got a part, uh, they're, they're in the land. They're enjoying the fruit of the land. They have cities they didn't build. They've got vineyards that they didn't plant. You know? They've got wells they didn't dig. 
because God's a good God and he gave them all that land. But they're cohabiting with the Canaanites after he told them you're to drive them out. Destroy them all. Okay? Those that don't flee, take them out. Take them out. They didn't do it, as this chapter reminds us in vivid color. Judah didn't do it. Benjamin didn't do it. Manasseh didn't do it. Asher didn't do it. Naphtali didn't do it. Over and over and over and over again. When you see things repeated in the Scripture, it's for emphasis. It's like, get it. You know, he says it once, hopefully you listen. He says it a second time, you better perk up. He says it third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, twelve times, you better wake up. He's sending you a message. So the first part of this book, first couple of chapters, is apathy. This is the high point. It doesn't get better after here. It gets worse. Okay? Chapters 3 through 16 is the apostasies as they begin these cycles. Okay? And then at the end, chapter 17 through 21, the final stage is anarchy. You know what anarchy is? It means lawlessness. You know, you pick up the phone and you dial 911 and nobody comes. Okay? There's no government. There's no police force. There's no fire department. It's anarchy. It's anarchy. Now, look at uh, Judges 17, just to kind of give you a little primer as to what I'm talking about here. Judges 17, verse 6. Judges 17, verse 6. This is at the end of the, of the book now. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay? Chapter 18, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the Danites sought uh, them an inheritance to dwell in. Okay? But there's no king in Israel. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. Okay? Once, twice, three times. Chapter 21, verse 25. Last verse, last chapter. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's anarchy. No king, no central authority. Every man does that which is right in, right in his own eyes. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that when man does that, the ways of a man are death. When you do that which is right in your own eyes, that's a prescription for death. You know, I got people around, drive around, shooting people walking down the street for no reason at all. They don't know them, they've never met them. They just decide to pull out a gun and blow them away. You know? They break into houses, people they never know. Shoot who's in, ever in their way or have their way with them. They do that which is right in their own eyes. There's no fear of God. They do that which is right in their own eyes. That is anarchy. And that's where this book takes us. It starts with apathy, and then it turns to apostasy. In other words, turning away from God, okay, and turning to other gods, and compromise, and cohabitation with the ites of the land. And then it ultimately leads to anarchy. And that's where this thing goes. Now, 
what is the application of the book of Judges? Now, those that are around here, you know this, but there are three applications to Scripture. One is historical. This book is a book of history, okay? It's also a book of prophecy. And it's also a book for personal application, okay? And any book in here and any passage in here, there are those three applications. It's not often taught anymore, you know. We like these little softball sermons and we like the little spiritual milkshakes and the feel-good stuff. But there are principles here. Number one, historically it's seven cycles of defeat in a downward spiral. That's what it is historically. Doctrinally, it is a picture of the tribulation after the church age. Joshua, what's Joshua's name mean? Yeshua? Jesus, Lord of salvation. After, it's a picture of the church age. Judges is a picture of the tribulation. Because throughout all this debauchery in the book of Judges, God continues to deliver the remnant of Israel. And in the seven-year tribulation that is coming, after Christ comes back for His own, in that period of time, the Lord will break the nation of Israel, bring them to their knees, Daniel chapter 12 says. He will break the power of the holy people. But yet through all the devastation of the book of Revelation, there will come out the end a believing remnant of Israel. Judges is a picture of that. Okay? A type. And so, I mean, we're going to see some horrific stories in the book of Judges. But we will see them at their low point cry unto God and He will deliver them. Just like in the tribulation, in the book of Zechariah, it says, basically it teaches that in their lowest point, they will call upon Him whom they have pierced. Who that be? Jesus. The nation of Israel is back in the land. The nation of Israel is back in unbelief. They are surrounded by enemies. They cohabit with them. One of these days, this period of the judges prophetically will start ticking as these cycles. And in that, he will, he will de ultimately deliver them because he promised to. And anything that God says in this book, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. Both the blessings and the cursings. So it is a doctrinal picture of the tribulation after the church age. After the time of the church age comes tribulation for the children of Israel. This is a time of tribulation for the children of Israel. Inspirationally, how do we apply it to ourselves? There's tremendous principles here that we need to learn if we want to live victorious, if we want to live the principles of Joshua and not the principles of Judges. Okay? The choice is ours. You make the choice every day. You pay the consequences every day. Every day. So, the book of Judges is about the defeated Christian life. We're going to look about the causes of the defeat. A few principles I'll extract out of this passage. Now, I taught a lot of this when we were going through Joshua. This big section here about Caleb and the uh, uh, killing the, uh, the uh, giants, Axaw and Othniel I covered when we were going through Joshua 14 and 15. I won't spend a lot of time on that this morning. But I will try to pick principles out of this that you can see some principles so you can live victoriously and not in defeat. So let's have a word of prayer as we start that. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the truth that's in it. Father, for preserving this book. Father, uh, we spent a whole weekend uh, reaching out to people just trying to see if they even know what the Ten Commandments are. Father, most don't. Those that knew them all, I could count on one hand all weekend. Uh, Father, people don't know the Word. Even Christians don't know the Word. Uh, Father, we live in that day and age. The Bible says that in the last days there will be a famine in the land, not a lack of bread, but of hearing the Word of the Lord. We're in that time. Lord, we uh, thank You for the opportunity to, to, to meet some folks and, uh, and to uh, hopefully, Lord, that, uh, uh, to influence them and help us to reach out to them because the time is short. Lord, uh, we thank You for this. We pray that You'd help me to lay out some principles here that we might apply and that, Father, we might go forth and live victorious and not in defeat and avoid the traps and the consequences that we see in the book of Judges. Now help us, Lord. We're dependent upon Your Spirit and thankful for Your Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's take a look at this. What are the causes of the defeat? And like I said, this book starts on a, on, at the high place. <laughs> the high place is in chapter 1. It's all downhill from here. But in this pot process, what is the number one cause of defeat? It's neglecting the Word of God. Neglecting the Word of God. Uh, you see it. We know it in our own lives if we're honest. We see it in our society. We see it in our churches. Our churches have neglected and departed from the Word of God. And you see the consequence. Our nation has departed from the Word of God. The Bible says He turns all nations into hell that forget God. He's turning this one into hell even as we are sitting here this morning. Each day it's getting worse and worse. We are reaping what we have sown as a nation. We reap what we have sown uh, as a uh, family or as an individual. Uh, the Bible says you sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. Uh, the nation of Israel, through their neglect of the Word of God, for, through their incomplete obedience, which is disobedience, okay? Partial obedience is disobedience, folks. Make no mistake, partial obedience is disobedience. You know, this whole idea that God's going to bless me and I'm walking in disobedience, uh, like I said, you're smoking dope. It ain't going to happen. Uh, you want the, the blessings of God, you need to walk in obedience to His Word. You neglect His Word, you think you're going to do it on your own, you're just going to watch the carnage that's going to happen in your life, in your family. It's going to happen. Neglect the Word. God's people are to respond to God's call without hesitancy. Now, a lot of commentators look at this and they spend a lot of ink talking about, you know, how they, they called upon the Lord uh, to who's going to go up first, okay? <clears throat> and then they say, uh, Sim, uh, Judah calling unto Simeon saying, come up with me unto my lot and fight with me. <clears throat> Let me tell you, prayer is admirable. You know, a lot of times we don't pray, we just act. And seeking God's will is admirable. But not if He's already told you what to do. Okay? This whole idea that God's told you what to do, and I'll pray about it. You know, I'm going to pray about what God has told me to do. No, if he's told you to do it, you are to do it. Okay? Now here he says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass when the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up, for behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. This is not the first time that this has been said. You go back into chapter 14, 
okay, of Joshua, where Caleb's story is, as he, the, as he did to all the tribes, he said, go and drive out the inhabitants of the land. Don't worry about the chariots and the horses. He says, and when you overtake them, hock the horses and burn the chariots. Okay? Don't trust in the chariots. Don't confiscate the enemy's weapons to use. You trust me. Go. You know, it, it, it reminds me more of, you know, hey, God's told us to go. Well, Chris, you want to go first? Who's going to go first? You going to go first or am I going to go first? You know, he's told us to go. To go. And when he's told you to go, there shouldn't be any hesitancy. When you know what the will of God is concerning you, you need to do it. That's the bottom line. You understand, if you're a Christian this morning and you're here, you have a ministry. You have a calling. You may not know what it is, but if you don't, you need to find out. And as soon as you find out what it is, then you need to start doing it. Okay? There should be no hesitancy for God's people. Now, they start out with this statement, who shall go up first? Look at chapter 20, verse 18. Chapter 20, verse 18 says, And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Now, don't totally misunderstand what I'm saying here. Judah was the first tribe to get their land grant. They were the first one charged with going to battle. But because Judah was charged to go to battle didn't mean that Simeon, Benjamin, Naphtali, and everybody else just to sit home on their duff. Every one of them was given an inheritance to go possess. They start out here in the book of Judges with the task of fighting the enemy. By Judges 20, they're fighting each other. That's really what happens when God's people don't do what he's called them to do. Rather than going out and fighting the enemy, by the end, they end up fighting each other. That's the problem. People, like I said, are to respond to God's call. Moses responded to God's call. He led them out. Joshua responded to God's call. He led them in. Caleb, who was of Judah, went up and says, give me that mountain. I know, I, why do I, I the, the, the uh, giants are there. That's why I want it. He wasn't trying to avoid the fight. He wanted into the fight. Because he wholly followed the Lord, the Bible says. And God delivered the giants into his hands. Go up and do it. it you know, prayer's good. Seeking the will of God's good. But if he's already told you what to do, which he has done at Sinai, which he has done at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, which he did right before Joshua's death, a second time at Mount Ebal and Gerizim at Shechem. He's already told them what to do. Go up and do it. Drive the ites out of the land. And then they're sitting there, oh, who, who, who's going to go first? You going to go first? How about you going to go first? You know, who's, oh, let's pray about it. You know? And then, second cause of defeat is enlisting the help of man rather than trusting God. Verse 3, And Judah said unto Simeon, His brother, come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon, you study the history of Simeon, Simeon loses their tribal identity before this is all over. They just get assimilated. But the issue is God's already told them, I will deliver them into your hand. You know, if he's told me, I will deliver them into your hand, why do I need to ask Sean to come with me? 
You know? He's already told me, I'm going to deliver them into your hand. Now, hey, it's good to have the brothers around us. Sometimes he says, go up as, you know, go as one man. But now they're in their tribal inheritance. He said, I will deliver them into your hand. Just go. Just do it. Some people are just waiting for somebody else to do it for them. You understand, Joshua at this point is dead. You understand that one, and we talked about it the last couple of weeks, one day this generation, and I'm talking about us, the gray-headed generation, will be gone. It will be up to the next generation that follows to pick up the banner and keep going. Okay? That's the whole pattern of Scripture. Don't wait for somebody else to do it for you. You know? We're in a day and age where people are perfectly content to go to a church or to go to an activity. Okay? They won't help set up. They won't help close it down. They don't want to work at it. They don't want to do this. They just want to come and partake. They're content with having somebody else do it for them. There's a role for everybody. Psalm 60 verse 11 says, Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Judah didn't need Simeon's help. God already told you, I'm going to deliver him into your hand. You know? Another cause of defeat. Now here, they're doing okay. Like I said, we're starting out. I want you to keep in mind, chapter 1 is the high water mark. It's the high water mark. And it goes down from here. Failing to realize the adversary will cause us to lose our grip and be off balance unless we do so to him. Look at verse... Four. It says, And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew them in Bezek ten thousand men. And they found Adonai Bezek. And they fought against him and slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and great toes. Okay? You cut off your thumb... You have a hard time holding a sword and wielding it. You cut off somebody's great toes, they have a hard time keeping their balance. Okay? The adversary, what they did to their adversary is they cut off his thumbs and his great toes. Now look what it says there. They brought, in Ad, uh, verse 7, and Adonai Bezek, uh, said, three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so hath God requited me. In other words, what goes around comes around. The adversary did that to his enemies. Okay? He subjugated them. And, and Adonai Bezek is saying, now that it's been done to me, that's exactly what I deserve. The enemy, if you're not fighting against him, will overtake you. And he will cause you to lose your grip and cause you to lose your balance and subjugate you. So you better subjugate him. You better be on the offense. You know, because you'll be the victim. He's, he's saying it. I did it to 70 kings. This is a picture of, an, of the adversary. We need to be on offense. There's a lot of God's people have lost their grip. They've lost their grip on this. They don't all squat about it. Okay? They don't know the Word of God. 
Not being taught. Not being preached. You know? They don't, they, they, don't know, they don't even know it, where to begin. Some of them, you ask them to uh, Ten Commandments, they, they can't even think of one. Yeah. You know, the sad part about it was how many people that came up and said, I'm a preacher's kid. And I don't, can't remember them either. Yeah. I'm the daughter of a Baptist preacher. Don't know anything about the book. Yeah. Where do you go to church? Uh, we're uh, in between churches right now. That was probably 40, 50% of the responses. That's another way of saying, I don't go. Yeah. I don't go. And I'm talking about not just kids, I'm talking about people with gray hair. Yeah. You know? That's where we're at. That's where we're at today. You wonder why our society is what it is? You wonder why our families are in a tailspin? Our inner cities are in a meltdown? Crime, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, rampant, you know? Drive-by shootings, I mean, debauchery, you name it. They got away from God. Nations got away from God. They don't, they don't, they don't know, you know? They're off balance, they have no grip. If you're not on offense against the enemy, you're going to be a victim of the enemy. Just a matter of time. He'll cut your thumbs and great toes off too. <clears throat> Next thing, failing to trust God in the valleys as we do on the mountaintops. Now, the story of Caleb, I can say this is part of the high point that's inserted in here. We already studied it. We're not going to go back through it in detail. It's in verse 9 through 18. Caleb took the mountains. Caleb defeated the giants. Othniel, you know, got the hand of Axaw, his daughter. It's a great story. Great, great lessons there. We've already talked about them. But it says in verse 19, almost like a little insert here. It says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain. But he could not drive, drive out the inhabitants of the valley. You know, Christians, are, I think, are famous for this. They can trust God on the mountaintops. When everything's going good, you know, they got confidence in their God. Ah, he's putting meat on the ta table, money in the bank, everything's going good. But in the valley, when they're facing the enemy and the chariots of iron, they ain't got the strength to handle it. They'll trust God on the mountaintop, but they won't trust Him in the valley. Won't trust Him in the valley. And so Judah, as great a tribe as the tribe of Judah was, and after the great story of Caleb, says, they could not drive them out of the valley. They didn't trust. They could trust him in the mountains. They couldn't trust him in the, in the valleys. <clears throat> Another cause of defeat. Allowing peaceful coexistence with the Canaanites. Verse 22. The house of Joseph. And they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to decry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city. And they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance of the city, and we shall show thee mercy. And he showed them the entrance into the city, and they smote the city with the edge of the sword. 
But they let the man go and all his family, and the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name of it Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. Verse 27, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bashan. Okay? Verse 28, it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. They were told to drive them out. And they weren't told them to put them under the tax code. Okay? And so they cut a peace treaty. They were told in the book of Joshua, you're not to have any peace treaties. You're not to have any marriage, intermarriages. You're not to incorporate any of their pagan or religion or their practices or their rites. None of that. They were told that over and over again. Deuteronomy, Numbers, Exodus, Joshua. They didn't drive them out. You know, what's, what's the call today? The world says we're to have inclusion. Uh, the world today says we need to have tolerance. The world today has, says you have to have diversity. The world today says you have to have acceptance. And they teach them all as virtues. Here in the corporate world, they have classes on them. Okay? And their definition behind that is that basically this general acceptance of anything Anything goes. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the, Bible, the Lord is inclusive. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. The world. He lo God so loved the world. Tolerance. We're to accept everybody's lifestyle, everybody's sin, you know, today. If not, you're a hater. You're a hater. No. He says, put the sodomites out of the land. Put them out of the land. Otherwise, it will affect you, your family, your kids. You know, it is not a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle choice of sin. That's what it is. Plain and simple. Taught in the Old Testament, taught in the New Testament. Okay? Is that popular? No. Whoever li may listen on the website probably aren't going to like that. A lot of other things I say, but I don't like either. either. But I can give, give you chapter and verse. I don't care what the world's attitude is. Okay? And they can't write enough laws to shut me up. Ain't going to happen. But that's what we've got today. Go to the Scripture. John 3, 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There isn't a person out there in any lifestyle that cannot be saved. But to say that your lifestyle is normal and natural when the Bible says that it's an abomination and it's unnatural. I'll go with the Bible any time over the opinion of men. We call alcoholism and drug abuse sicknesses today. It's sin sickness. They are drunkards. There's the Bi what the Bible calls, calls sin, don't call sickness. Unless you want to put sin in front of it. Is, is the Word of God inclusive? You know? Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. How much more inclusive can you get than that? In Christ, it, don't, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, red, whatever. 
you come to Christ, you're one in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean we are to cohabit with the Canaanites and accept the sin. Because when you dwell among the Canaanites, it will affect you. When you practice what they practice, it will affect you. When the church makes the mistake of bringing the Canaanite into the church, it will affect and pollute and corrupt the church. Ephesians 2.13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometime afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. There is not a man or a woman, there is not a person of any ethnic background that cannot be saved. Okay? For God so loved the world. But God help the world that calls all this sin and debauchery a healthy lifestyle or a natural lifestyle. That's what's wrong with this country. That's what's wrong with our society. That's why the judgment of God is upon this place. And let me tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. Psalm 711 says, God is judges the righteous and is angry with the wicked every day. <clears throat> Psalm 9710, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Hate evil. Don't wink at it. You know? Don't pretend like it's okay. Now, you may have family members involved in it. You may have neighbors involved in it. You may have coworkers inv involved in it. And we just walk around. Don't say a word. God forbid. You know, those people need to be saved. You don't want to make them comfortable in their sin because if they die in that condition, they're going to hell. Psalms 119, 104 says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Where do you find his precepts? Right here. Through his precepts. We got a whole world out there and in a lot of churches that don't know his precepts. Their knowledge of this book is a mile wide and an inch deep. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. You say, oh, you just sound so mean. No, I want to see them saved, okay? I want to see them come to Jesus. I, you know, I was one of those, you know, I was a typical 24-year-old lost guy, you know? I mean, I'd, I ain't going to rehearse everything I did. You and my wife don't know everything I did, okay? <clears throat> but I got saved. I got saved changed my heart, forgave my sin, gave me a place in heaven. Yeah. After I got saved, I, wanted, I only had one brother. I wanted to lead him to the Lord. I wanted to see him come to Christ. Took a little while, but he did. Yeah. And then his buddies. I was at the uh, farmer market and ran into a couple, and they said they asked him where they went to church, and he said, a little Bible church in Grandview. And so I identified the church, and he said, yeah, that's where I go. And he said, I said, you know Jeff Wears, his family? Oh, yeah. Some of our best friends. I said, say hello to him. He's one of the guys that got saved in the Bible study in my house when I was witnessing to my brother. Yeah. 35 years ago, okay, I want to see him saved. He was a drug addict. He was a drug addict. He drove up to my house. We had a little house over by the stadium. He drove up one day, and every Friday, Friday night we had it. All of a sudden, I hear this rumble, rumble, you know. This Harley pulls up into the uh, yard, and this guy gets out and takes his helmet off, does one of these numbers, and he's got 
hair down to his waist and a full beard and, you know, look like Grizzly Adams or something. Comes up to the door, says, is this where the Bible study is? I said, yeah. He said, I'm a friend of Paul's. I said, come on in. And he came for several weeks. Didn't say nothing. You know, just sat there and looked at me, you know. And I'm sharing the, the Word of God as best I can. And then one day, I looked over at him, and, and he was crying like a baby right there in the house. And uh, I said, Jeff, I said, is there some uh, decision you need to make today? And he starts fighting back the tears and stuff. <clears throat> that Sunday, on a Sunday night, he comes to church. And uh, I don't remember what the message was on. They gave an invitation. He was sitting about halfway back in the auditorium. And when they gave that invitation, he came out of that pew like, a, like somebody shot out of a cannon. You know? He came down to the front and got, got saved, gave his heart to the Lord. You know? The following week, I hear a knock at the door. I open the door and there's a guy standing there, clean shaven, hair cut. I didn't even recognize him. He had to tell me who he was. You know? I said, Jeff. He said, yeah. He said, all that was a part of my past. You know? Christ is my future. Yeah. I didn't tell him that. I didn't tell him he had to cut his hair or cut his beard or, you know, any of that stuff. The Lord spoke to him. Yeah. That was part of his past, part of his drug past, part of his rebellion, you know. Changed his life. Married a guy in a church, had a bunch of kids. Probably got grandkids by now. Don't want to be condemning to them. You want to share Jesus Christ with them. God is angry with the wicked every day. They need Jesus. When we compromise our decisions, verse 27, I'm almost done. Got diverted a little bit there. Another cause for defeat is compromise. They compromised. They put some of the Canaanites to tribute, the materialism. Hey, they can live here as long as they give us tax money, you know. Love of money, power, sex, whatever it is, you know, whatever our vice is. Every man and woman's vice is different. When you compromise, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting your family up for failure. You're setting your kids up for failure. When you ain't got time for God, you're too busy with your agenda instead of his agenda, you're sending a message. Pretty soon, you're going to find yourself doing stuff that you can't even imagine that you would ever do. Now, like old Jeff, he, he, he cut away the old. But you, you start playing with the old, you start getting comfortable with the old way, it will affect you. Like that old cathedral song, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Slowly by slowly taking control. You know, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay and the pr price you'll pay is far more than you want to pay. That's what happens when you forget off leaving the mission. It affects others. It affects you. It affects your family. It affects your brothers and sisters. It affects your children. It affects your grandchildren. Children, grandchildren, they need an example today. We need men that lead their families. We need men that set an example. 
We need men and women that are willing, willing to sacrifice. Set the tone. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You want to serve the gods on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? Do it. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it begins to affect others if you don't. You compromise it. You leave off the battle. It will eventually destroy you and everybody around you. It will embolden the enemy. The Amorites pushed the Danites up into the mountain, wouldn't allow them to dwell in the valley. Like I said, you can go on from there, and there's more detail there, but the, the issue is there are causes of defeat. This book will give you the causes of the defeat. It will give you the consequences of the defeat. But you're going to learn it. Mark it down. Write it in your Bible. Put it in your head. Write it on this disk drive, you know. Don't fall into the trap. Joshua, the victorious Christian life, judges the defeated life. Which one you want? Which one you want? It goes from sin to being a servant of sin to crying out to God to save you from your own actions and the consequences of your own actions if it's not too late for you and your family. And then praying to Him, making supplication to Him to come and deliver you and to put you right back on top. And you know what? As Christians, we fall into that trap sometimes individually. We fall away. We start suffering the consequences of sin. We hit bottom. We cry out unto Him. And thank God a faithful God still hears prayer and still comes and rescues us from our own stupidity. You know? But you know what? You shouldn't have to learn all the lessons the hard way. You know? You don't have to make every mistake. Learn from the mistakes of others. Don't find yourself trapped in these cycles of defeat.